Hello there, and welcome back to a study in the study. I hope you've got your Bible and notebook ready, as well as a cuppa, as we meet together around God's Word and hear what He has to say to us today. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord, we thank you that you speak to us through your Word. Speak to us now as we read your Word together and listen intently for what you have to say to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn again to the letter of First Peter. Last time that we met, we read just the first two verses, and from this gained a sense of what Peter is trying to do. He's encouraging a church under pressure by reminding them who they are. They are God's. He develops this further now as we read together verses 3 to 9. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. Like last time, our first question is what did this passage mean? when it was first written? And that must be our first question, because it helps us establish this foundation upon which the rest of our understanding can be built. And as before, I'm here to help you answer that question. Remember, Peter is writing to a church under pressure. They are suffering particularly because of their faith. Through persecution, they have been scattered. Since he wants to encourage them in their faith, it stands to reason that he begins by reminding them of the greatest thing that their faith can give them, hope. He talks to them about their inheritance. Now, normally we receive an inheritance when someone else dies. And that is true even in this case. The one who died was Jesus. Since he died, God has given us an inheritance. But we do not enjoy this inheritance quite yet. Although it comes to us through one who died, in order to receive it, we too must die. That is why for now, God protects our inheritance in heaven until we are ready to receive it in full. That is also why we can be sure we will receive our inheritance. It is given to us by and through Christ, and it is protected by God. We've done nothing to earn it, so it stands to reason that we can do nothing to lose it. For God has chosen in his mercy to give it to us. And God always keeps his promises. And he has promised to us an inheritance. So we will have it. But what actually is our inheritance? What is it that we will receive because Jesus died and that God is holding on to us for now, but will give us in the future? Well, Peter talks about this as new birth, but there's another word that Christians use for this. Resurrection. Resurrection is the promise of new life. When we rejected God, we opened the way for death to come into our world. As a minister, even at this early stage in my ministry, I've seen my fair share of death. I've been there with grieving families as we have laid a loved one to rest. I've seen the pain and the sadness and the tears. And on a deep level, I look at death and I think, this is wrong. This is not the way things are supposed to be. 
I have often wondered if we all have that little voice in us, which looks at death and says, this is wrong. Because on some level we know we were never meant to die. God created us to live eternally. The only reason we die is because we rejected God and that rejection invited death into our world. Resurrection is God's way of putting that right. It is a word that says death is not the end. There is life beyond death. Another one of the writers in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, he describes resurrection like this. In his letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and at verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but will be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we all will be changed. Resurrection is the ultimate hope of the Christian faith. It is a promise that we who believe shall never perish. Though we may die to this life, we will be raised again. We will live on a new earth, with new bodies, still recognisably ourselves, but no longer decaying. Things like death, disease, pain, suffering, they will all be gone. We will live as God intended, for eternity, in everlasting peace and joy, enjoying both God and his creation. This is why Peter ends this section by describing the church as receiving in the present the end result of their faith. Because of the hope they have for the future, they are able to live joyfully today despite their suffering. And one day their joy will be complete as they are raised to life with Christ. Only this time their suffering will be no more. It is also worth noticing that Peter commends the church for believing in Jesus even although they have not seen him. And it's likely Peter is remembering that moment when Jesus appeared to his disciples after his own resurrection. And he said to them, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. That's John chapter 20, verse 29. So to our second question, where is Jesus in this passage? Well, we've already kind of answered that one, but for the sake of clarity, this passage points to Jesus because it was his death and resurrection which grant us this inheritance to eternal life. And we can be sure we'll receive it because Jesus did all the work to make sure that that would be the case. All we need do is believe and receive. Which brings us to the final question which you will ponder after this video is finished. What does this passage mean to me today? Maybe you need hope. Maybe you need that assurance that God has an inheritance for you and you will receive it. Maybe this passage has moved you to praise God for all that he has done for you through Christ. Whatever it is, I encourage you, write down what God has said to you through this passage and treasure it. As for me, well, the biggest challenge for me in this passage is to have that eternal view. I can very easily become despondent, focused on my immediate concerns, and in doing so, I lose my joy. In this passage, God is encouraging me to lift my eyes to the future, to see the inheritance that he has in store for me, and to find my joy in that as I live right now. As before, I encourage you to finish by taking whatever God has spoken to you and turn it back to him in prayer. Today I will be giving thanks to God for the hope that he has given us and the encouragement to find joy in that hope. I look forward to you joining me again. For now, may God bless you and I'll speak to you soon.